This is the last island community of its kind in Virginia. There's no other place like it. There, there's, there's no other people, no other language, no other heritage quite like what you find on Tangier Island. And it's such a part of the fabric of not only Virginia, but America. This is their culture that they helped build from when they came over from England back in the 16, 17, 1800s. The roads are narrow and the homes are little and modest, little postage stamp type yards with little cyclone fences and picket fences and little shops and a grocery store and a school and several churches. The people that I met, they love the sea. They love the oysters and they love the crabs. This is their pride and joy, this, this seafaring way of life, being at one with their job every day. I mean, I didn't see a waterman when I was there who wasn't smiling after a hard day's work out on the water. There is an isolation, and yet there is a desire to be part of the community, too. You know, you're flying in Chopper 10, and you're getting this view of the bay, and it's gorgeous, and we saw the sunlight coming through the clouds in these rays coming through the clouds. You're thinking, where is it? And pilot Steve Decker is pointing, there it is. And it's still way off in the distance and you're getting closer and closer. You see these little homes and the water tower and all these little patches of land that are just sitting on the water. These homes are just sitting on the water. And you think, wow, this is a little city, a one square mile city in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay. But it's so quiet. If I'm talking, and Jeff Myers is shooting video of a sunrise, and you hear these, the seagulls loud and clear from a great distance away. He's like, shh, I can hear you whispering because your voice carries over the water, and it's so quiet on the island. It's so peaceful, it's so tranquil. I was standing on a, on a fishing boat after they were bringing the oysters in, Jeff and I, and we were trying to listen to a conversation among all the watermen and the uh, marine police there watching their catches to make sure that they were you know, adhering to, to the laws of you know, their quotas and whatnot. We were listening to that conversation on board the boat as they were dumping the oysters in, and they're having this conversation. I go, I can't understand what they're saying. Yeah, he's giant. I mean, it's very fascinating, but they've been, they're, They've been very warm and friendly toward us, and they want their story to be told. They feel forgotten. Sometimes uh, they, they get the sense that when we talk about these larger issues, many people call it climate change, global warming, um, or just sea level rise, um, erosion. That's the very big problem on the island, as it has been for about 150 years, the erosion, the constant battering from the storms against this small island. They have a problem, and they need help. I've read by many experts who have studied what's going on at Tangier Island that these people could be one of the first climate refugees or the first climate refugees in the country. So I think there seems to be an urgency that we can prevent that from happening. And this doesn't get into the entire debate about man-made global warming and man-made climate change. That's, that's an argument for it a different time possibly. This is a practical solution. This is something that's happening, and this is something that demands action of some kind. Seawalls, dunes, protection. When you look at Tangier Island, is it the canary in the coal mine? Is it the, the little reminder that could be us in the coming decades if we don't address this now, especially with trying to uh, preserve what we have here in Hampton Roads and along our coastline.